We're just coming out of this uh, very interesting top 500 session and we have seen a number of interesting things here. One, one was the fact that uh, the number 500, the speed of the number 500 is not growing at the same rate that we saw over the last years. Uh, would you expect that uh, we see that same slowdown in increase of speed for the whole list over the next years? So uh, what we're seeing is a slowing down of certain machines and that's a result of, um, I'll say, an investment being put into high performance computing. Everything is going to be driven by funding. If the funding is there, machines will be purchased and those machines will be deployed in the scientific industry. That funding is not just for hardware. There has to be a, 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 a real build out of high performance computing, building out that whole ecosystem. So the ecosystem is driven by a number of things. It's driven by, of course, the hardware has to be in place, applications, the, the algorithms, the software, the operating system, the compilers, all have to be funded at a level which can support the kinds of architectures and machines that would be needed to build out that, that high performance computing system. And um, you know, we do see a slowdown at the low end of this, uh, this curve that, uh, that was shown in the top 500 data that was presented by Eric. And that, I think, uh, can also be attributed to the fact that um, perhaps we're seeing a saturation of certain, uh, certain uh, groups of people with, in terms of the floating point capability. They've got, enough, they've got enough computing, so they don't need any more. And we know that's not true at the high end. We can point to very clearly applications that are going to require exascale computing in order to uh, effectively deal with them. And those are the applications that we have to target for the high performance machines. So there's a need at the top end for these machines. There's a requirement that funding be injected into the system. And there'll be a trickle down of equipment from that as a result of that injection. Okay, thank you. So we spoke about funding and, and you mentioned in your talk yeah, that's just about funding. Your, your that's, question about yeah. the, the end of the okay. end of the list at the at the level at the 500 level, right? So the first surprising fact there is actually it's it's exponential. Mm -hmm. And naively, if you expect that we have systems twice as long, just means the sh the, the, the 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 trend should shift to a lower level, but that continue then continue along the t lines of technology. So it should recover to the old growth rate, just at a lower level. And it's very surprising to me that we haven't seen that in the last five years. So I'm still not 100% convinced that it is only economical. Okay. Right? But the question is, the question is, is the question is about investment. The question yeah. really is, do we need more money there? Uh, is it that we need more money for the ecosystem, or do we also probably need more money for larger systems because we see part of the growth coming from higher investments? The ecosystem needs both parts. You can't have high performance computing without big computers and spending for it. And you can't use those big computers without having, having spent and having done your homework in terms of applications, in terms of infrastructure, software and infrastructure and those things. So I totally agree there with Jack uh, that we're going to have to continue to do that uh, across the board. And I actually strongly believe that uh, this lack of funding for the hardware side is a reflection of the lack of funding on the software side currently as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's just the hardware which, which is, has gotten hit the last couple of years, it's the software as well. And in the long run, that is actually probably the worst thing uh, because to recover lack of research and la lack of progress in compilers and in infrastructure, operating systems, and in applications takes much longer than it takes to buy a new system. You can always throw money at hardware, that's the simple part. Okay. But actually spending money and building up all the science and technology behind which you need to really productively use those systems, that's the difficult part. That's what needs constant um, funding and that's what I'm concerned about is when I see these numbers from the top 500. Okay. Would, would, you, would you both say we need more funding for software in the future than we did in the past, or do you think we only have to maintain what we have done so far? It's going to require more funding, and that comes about because of the uh, fundamental need for a change in how we do it. We can't carry on in the same way. That is, the, ap the applications, the algorithms, and the software base that's necessary to move to the next level, to move to exascale computing, requires a really rethinking of how those applications, how those algorithms, and how that software base is there. And that's going to require additional funding to be put into the system. So thinking about keeping a steady state of funding levels won't make it. 
new ideas have to be brought in, new research has to be created in order to effectively deal with the, what's coming from exascale computing. There's such a great change in terms of the number of, um, the number of processes that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, the levels of, of uh, failure have to be accommodated for. Uh, you know, there's so many things in terms of the energy that's going to be put into the system that we have to start thinking about and that we will, really will require new ways to approach these problems. Okay. And that the funding, funding will have to be increased to do that. Okay, thank you. What would you answer? I would also agree that uh, funding, there is this, this fallacy, fallacy, this wrong notion, especially among funding agencies or people who have to pay for things, that you develop something once in software yeah. and then it's good forever. Come on guys, that's not even true for traditional technology. <laughs> you take a car, after 10 years it's old, after 20 years it's outdated. Uh, high performance computing, computing moves much faster technology wise than car technology. And the same, very same is true in high performance computing or in computing in general. The software we built 10 years is old, the software we, we built 20 years ago is useless. We should, we, should we throw things away and, and start from scratch, uh, using the lessons that we have learned, but still start from scratch? That is something painful to do, but uh, we often have to do it to really make progress. If you just keep updating the old things, that becomes very, very tedious and very, very difficult, right? It becomes non-productive. Okay, so you have to go through these through this cycle, cycles of rejuvenation, which includes rewriting certain things from scratch. Okay. So we have a very concrete example of that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a developer of numerical libraries. And uh, back in the late 70s, we developed uh, LinPack as a package of software. That software was targeted for a certain architecture, and when that architecture faded and new architectures came, we had to redo those, that software package. And that's what's going on with uh, LinPack. And when those architectures faded, new designs had to be put in place to deal with the complexities of distributed memory systems. And that software was replaced by something called ScalaPack. And today, we're going through that same effort. It's almost a 10-year cycle. Every decade, we need to do that investment again and change the fundamental software to accommodate the hardware changes. Now, one of the things we're talking more about today is this idea or notion of co-design. So the co-design, the architects, the applications, the software people, and the algorithms people get together and try to design a system that can effect effectively deal with their problems. Rather than just throwing a machine over the fence and having the applications people try to figure out how to get their application to fit, today we're trying to do that in a more coherent fashion of getting everybody together to help in the design of future systems. Okay, now that you mentioned Linpack yourself, I, I have a question concerning the top 500 list, because this is the topic that we wanted initially to talk about. Um, the, the story that you tell about Linpack, Scalaback, and next generation or whatsoever, gives the impression that in a sense Linpack is outdated. Now the list is based on the Linpack benchmark. How much sense does it make to continue that, or, and how much sense does it make to change it right. now that we have a sort of a collection of data over like 20, 22 years or something like that? That's right. So um, I think everybody agrees that the LINPAC benchmark and the top 500 pr provide a tremendous historical uh, viewpoint for computing and can spot trends into what's happening and what has happened and perhaps project into the future. I don't think we want to lose that, uh, that historic information. So keeping and, and maintaining that, uh, that database into the future I think is a good idea. On the other hand, we all realize that LINPAC as a benchmark really reflects one small component of the architecture and that's the floating point capability of the machine. And back when LINPAC was designed, hardware floating point was expensive and that was the part of the machine which people focused on. Today's machines have evolved so that floating point arithmetic is over-provisioned in our machines. It's incredibly over-provisioned. It, it, it runs at incredibly high speeds so that we can uh, do floating point operations in a matter of a couple of cycles. Data movement, on the other hand, is the thing which takes an enormous amount of time. So the LINPAC benchmark highlights the floating point capability but misses all the, other, all the other architectural features, in particular, the data movement one. Most real applications of, of, uh, have the need to move tremendous amounts of data to accomplish their tasks, and that's not being reflected. So new benchmarks 
are, are being looked at and examined to see if in fact they match uh, applications that are really run on these machines. And when we get a good match, then we should move forward and have that as perhaps the next generation of benchmarks. Not throwing away the data, but yeah. augmenting it. So Eric, would you agree with that? Keeping track of everything, you're the expert, you're the analyst of these uh, huge amounts of data. Would you agree with well, such a agree with, viewpoint? I agree, I agree with both aspects of this. Uh, one, 20 years ago, looking at Limpac, you had to look at the alternatives. And there were none, so we could have just listed systems based on peak, but that would have been very bad because it would have allowed all kind of paper tigers to enter the list. Machines which only existed on paper or as a pile of rubble in the basement and didn't actually work. So Olympic had and still has very positive function uh, that you actually have to have a functioning system to run it. Absolutely. But definitely architectures have changed so tremendously during the last two decades uh, that we need new benchmarks, uh, new software to actually adequately test those architectures and adequately represent our today's our, our applications. So definitely we have, we're going to have to work on that and we have to gonna start this cycle of um, rejuvenation and innovation in the top 500 for in terms of the benchmarking just like the industry goes through the cycles. Right? We have to do that. Okay, thank you very much for that perspective and thank you very much for the discussion. Thanks Erich. Thank yep. you Jack. Very, very it was a pleasure. Thank you.